Our second passage of scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, my favorite gospel, chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. This is uh, starting on page 1487 in your pew Bible, and of course is also on the screen. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow. Day. No prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning as we get started, I would like for you to recall a story or a moment. A memory of some kind in your mind. I want for you to begin to search your minds and think for a moment about a time when you are sure that you experienced God's love. Think about a moment in time when you have felt God's presence. Maybe the grace of a friend or a co-worker. Maybe the embrace of a partner. Maybe the provision of just when you needed them. Maybe it was just a sense of warmth that can only come from God in the midst of grief. Maybe it was a sense of peace during your time of prayer. Take a moment and just flesh out that memory. Relive it as best as you can. And when you are ready, give thanks to God for that experience and for the memory that you now have to hang your hat on. I contemplated using our time this morning by just simply inviting several of you to share those experiences here with the congregation, but I didn't want to make people feel uncomfortable or pressured to do any sort of public speaking, and so we're not going to do that this morning, but I do encourage you to find a way somehow to share that story with somebody. Maybe it's on your drive home from church today. You call somebody or you talk to somebody that you rode with and you share your story with them. Maybe you just need to journal it and you're going to share it that way. Maybe it'll be over lunch or a conversation sometime next week. But I invite you to share that story, story and grace in your life. Many of you know that I recently went through my ordination interviews. I actually saw that it was in the bulletin, a celebration for Pastor You and I. And I appreciate your prayers and your celebrating with me. The process for ordination in the United Methodist Church is long and quite extensive. My own journey involved seven years of schooling and nine years of being a pastor before finally reaching the interview stage. And as part of those interviews, there are actually three separate interviews, which all happen on the same day in the same location. There's an interview on self-care, there's an interview on the practice of ministry, and of course there's an interview which covers the candidate's grasp of theology, or uh, tests the candidate's own theological claims. For my last interview, the theology interview, I was prepared for questions surrounding my understanding and beliefs about baptism and communion and salvation and the Trinity and all of those sorts of theological concepts. And they did ask about many of those, but the first question they asked me actually caught me off guard. 
You can only preach one sermon, and you only have one opportunity to do it. What do you preach? It's a big deal. You've got one sermon, one opportunity to preach it. What is it that you're going to share with the community of God's people? Think about that for yourself. You have one opportunity to tell somebody about the Lord. Just one. What is it that you share? How do you limit it to just one thing? Out of the lifetime of experiences that you have had with God, you can only preach one sermon and you only have one opportunity to do it. What do you preach? So I sat there for a moment and I think the team actually was equally unprepared for my answer as I was for their question. My answer was this, the overwhelming and unconditional love of God. Now here I am in my theology interview for ordination and I had just given them the Sunday school answer, right? Jesus loves you. I think it can be easy to gloss over that truth and to genuinely take that idea and that truth and that perspective for granted. We are so accustomed to hearing it, so accustomed to saying it, so accustomed to knowing it that it is remarkably easy to lose our sense of awe about it. God loves you. The creator of all that has been, is, and will be. you got to change everything. Maya Angelou said it well when she was telling the story of her own encounter with this reality. She was reading with the late Frederick Wilkerson and came across this line, God loves me. And at his urging, she read it over and over and over again and describes the experience this way. God who made the leaves and fleas and stars and rivers and you loves me. And that is amazing. Amazing it really is. The love of God for us that is so deep and wide that there are not enough words or images in any language in existence to adequately describe it. One of the ways we try to do this is through our songs, through our hymns, through uh, the arts, right? We just sang two songs, and we're going to sing another one before the service is over, all about God's wonderful love for us. This is not a new practice. Those who were held as slaves here in the States because of the great sins committed against them and the less than human living conditions that were forced upon them were compelled to extend their vision beyond things as they were were to a deeper, broader vision and to dream not as they are, but as they could be. We hear this reality in many of the spirituals, these sacred songs which stretch the contours of reality as it is given in the current social order and which points to a new form of heaven and earth, a new social order, a new institutional arrangement, a kingdom not born of or controlled by the powers of this world. One of those spirituals contains this line. Maybe you know it. There's plenty good room. Plenty good room. Plenty good room in my father's house. There's plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room in my Father's house. This is a central message of the gospel, especially the gospel as it is presented here in the gospel of Luke. In our passage, Jesus speaks of disappointment and heartbreak at the refusal of God's own people to hear and to heed the summons of God to draw near and to gather and to come home and to somehow see beyond themselves. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who were sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen would, and you would not. For Jesus, God's 
passionate dream and compassionate desire and bold determination is to gather God's children closer and closer and closer into God's embrace and love. This is the mission that is at the center of all of Jesus' work. Like a mother hen, God seeks to draw in, to embrace, to include, and to welcome all people in this family of humanity that God has intended. Luke's gospel sends this message in the very first pages of the book. Shepherds are the first to hear the good news of the Messiah. Shepherds, those who represented the fringe groups, the margins. And so right here in the beginning of Luke's gospel, we learn that the gospel of Jesus Christ transcends marginality and creates this context for a new human community, not born of social custom and hierarchy, but born of the very spirit of God. When Jesus begins his ministry, he identifies his work with the prophecy of Isaiah from the days of exile. This prophecy that saw the Spirit of God causing good news to be declared and changed in society. Jesus quotes Isaiah saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Talk about being under God's wing and lives being changed. And this isn't just talk in the Gospel of Luke. These aren't just good words that Jesus says. We see this actually lived out. Luke sees this persistent intent on the part of Jesus to bring in those who have been cast out, to raise up those who have been beaten down, to bring those on the extremes of society closer to the heart of God. This is the heart of Jesus' message, and that's why in the Gospel of Luke, a peasant girl sings a song of revolution when Mary sings, My soul magnifies the Lord. In my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. This is why in the Gospel of Luke, a prodigal son is welcomed home by a father whose compassion is extravagant and whose love seems reckless. And this is why in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells the story of the good to that the only good Samaritan was a dead Samaritan. In the Gospel of Luke, the story is told of the good thief who finds the kingdom of God while dying on a cross next to Jesus. And as this good news is declared and the Holy Spirit of God that was on Jesus is poured out on us, a new community emerges. A community full of great variety and diversity. A diversity that is woven into a new tapestry so that the ancient longings of the prophets are realized. Some of you may remember this quote from the book of Joel, which is also quoted in the book of Acts. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. All flesh. There's plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room in my Father's house. The spiritual recognizes that infinite reach and eternal embrace of God's love that is at the core of the message of Jesus. And so the question quickly becomes... How much room have we have we made our rooms too small? Our tables too short? The guest list not inclusive enough? Have we intentionally or unintentionally made God's kingdom smaller? Here's a more provocative way to ask the same question. Where is Vladimir Putin's room in God's house? It's the question, friends. Is Putin somehow outside of the love of God? Is anyone 
outside of the love of God? In Jesus' day, it would have been the same question with a different name. Is Herod outside of the love of God? Maybe for you, the line in the sand doesn't have anything to do with a world leader. And so maybe for you, it sounds a little more like, is Judas outside of the love of God? Are Muslims outside of the love of God? Which community have you named? Where have you drawn your line in the sand? Is there any who could truly be outside of the love of God? And the answer is no. There's plenty good room. The church doesn't have the capacity or the right to declare someone in and some out, some loved and some unlovable over and over and over again. We witness the reach of God's wing. It is that same reach that you experienced in whatever memory was conjured for you at the beginning of the message. It's that same reach that seeks each of us out day by day, begging for us to respond to the grace of God already active in our lives. It is that same reach that reaches out to us over and over and over and over again. Last Sunday, our toddlers, Bella and Caleb, were baptized. It was a joyful celebration, as all baptisms should be. And following the baptism, we sang a song that you may know, I was there to hear your morning cry. Are any of you familiar with that song? I was not until I came to Kim. Some of you are familiar with that. I want to read to you these lyrics which speak to this persistent reach of God into our lives. I haven't been able to do this since the baptism without crying, so hopefully I can you know, do this this morning. Lord, help me. I was there to hear your morning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice you were baptized to see your life unfold. I was there when you were but a child with a faith to suit you well. And in a blaze of light, you wandered off to find where demons dwell. When you heard the wonder of the word, I was there to cheer you on. You were raised to praise the living Lord, to whom you now belong. If you find someone to share your time, and you join your hearts as one, I'll be there to make your verses rhyme from dusk till rising sun. In the middle ages of your life, not too old, no longer young. I'll be there to guide you through the night, complete what I have begun. When the evening gently closes in and you shut your weary eyes, I'll be there as I have always been with just one more surprise. I was there to hear your morning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. One sermon left to preach. One opportunity. The overwhelming, unconditional love of God. For when we know the love of God, we can know purpose. We can know peace. We can know truth. We can know life. Church, God loves you. Don't forget it. Amen.